Um, this is our 10th month of salons. I'm really excited. And um, we do this monthly, bringing in speakers to talk about various aspects of psychedelia, um, to educate the community, to gather the community. So I encourage you to go out there, talk to other people, meet a couple of new friends, come back next month, talk to them again. You know, this is, uh, we're trying to, you know, create connections. And because one of the most important things about um, uh, integrating from a psychedelic experience is to really have a, a solid community around you to support you. So that's what we're trying to create here. Um, I'm really excited to um, introduce Caitlin. Um, we met at Lightning in a Bottle this year, and um, I, even, I, I saw your talk, I didn't get to see your talk at Lightning in a Bottle, but everyone was like, Ashley, she was great. We have to have her, you should have her on the salon. And I was like, okay. So um, I'm really excited to have you here and coming up from San Diego. So um, with that, Caitlin. Yeah. So do, do I use this microphone yeah, or? Um, that's just for the video. So this is for the audio for everybody else. Oh, this is for the video? Yes. OK. Both. Um, and then I have so many things to hold. Oh my god. <laughs> I need like an assistant. Well, I guess. We could, we could do the slides. As long as you guys don't mind me looking at the thing a little bit, I'll just yeah. screw the paper. Um, hi, my name's Caitlin. Um, thank you so much for, for all coming. Um, I'm really honored uh, that Ashley asked me to speak here. Um, I just started sort of speaking on this topic uh, like in February, and it's really been gaining momentum. And I've um, been learning a lot about myself and speaking and it's been really fun and I've made some really incredible connections from sharing the information that I've learned. Um, so this presentation I normally am doing at festivals for the most part so I'm usually like pretty sleep deprived and covered in dirt so this is like a nice change. I'm all dressed up and like um, fairly well rested so hopefully I'll be uh, on point tonight. Um, oh, did I? Okay. So, um, my background uh, is in biology and sort of my, my story about um, how I got here right now, um, it all started with me struggling with my own personal uh, battle with chemical depression and anxiety. Uh, I've been struggling really my whole life kind of on and off. Um, and my mom, you know, has had depression her whole life and uh, has been on antidepressant medications. And it wasn't actually until um, I kind of got into the harder classes of my undergraduate, like organic chemistry and stuff, and I found that the less that I partied and used psychedelics like LSD or mushrooms, the um, more unstable I became. And I finally uh, put two and two together, and I realized that I had been self-medicating with psychedelic drugs for many years, and it was when I got real busy and wasn't using them as often, around the like seven to eight weeks after my last like psychedelic experience, I noticed my, my chemistry sort of um, unraveling and becoming increasingly fragile. And that's when I realized that I even had chemical depression. And so I thought, okay, well, this is great. You know, LSD makes me feel better, but why don't I try to find the root cause? Like, there's got to be other ways to manage this besides taking powerful hallucinogens because, you know, that, that's not always uh, available or accessible um, or a good idea. So what I did is I started to dive into the neuroscience literature on the pathology of depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders. And I really kind of started an obsession. Um, and it, I just went down the rabbit hole, and I'm, I'm still down the rabbit hole. And I basically started to um, dig up all this, this research on nutrition's role in mood disorders. And happy to say, I totally cured myself. Like, I, I figured out what it was, and um, I don't think I'll ever be really clinically depressed ever again. Of, of course, everybody has moments of depression, but I feel like I have all the tools now to um, make sure it doesn't stick and to pull myself and uh, disrupt these 
depression patterns in the nervous system. So, um, as you can see, that was sort of related to me using psychedelics, and um, I'm a huge proponent of psychedelic research and uh, education and talking about entheogens because they've changed my life so significantly. And so I started my nutritional supplement company in hopes of sharing this information that I had accumulated out of uh, personal necessity. And um, I called the business Entheozen and I launched it about a year and a half ago. And I mostly wanted to focus on uh, mood enhancement but then I ended up making a party recovery supplement because I found that um, a lot of the same underlying mechanisms for helping a brain be resilient and healthy, you know, applied to people with depression and also applied to people who were staying up all night taking drugs at a festival. It's kind of the, the same, you know, optimal brain health principles either way. So, um, so Basically, this talk is meant to be a harm reduction guide um, for people who are usually at music festivals and um, staying up all night and consuming substances and really, really uh, going at it, you know? And so what happens when we're, when we're partying? What are we actually doing to ourselves? Well, sleep deprivation, like across the board, no matter who you are, no matter what type of music it is, no matter what type of party it is, when people are like partying, they're usually not sleeping enough. And um, oftentimes there's a lot of uh, very stimulating things going on. There's lots of LED lights and music and art and people and there's a lot of the sensory stimulation happening. And um, believe it or not, there are actually people drinking and taking drugs sometimes at these events. Shocking, I know, delinquents. Um, so what does that translate to physiologically? Well, this ends up leading to oxidative stress, which ends up leading to inflammation, which actually can end up leading to more oxidative stress, which I'll get there later. Um, and also this contributes to depletion of certain key molecules in the body that you need to function properly, including neurotransmitters, which help make you feel okay. Um, and very important molecules uh, and minerals and such like antioxidants and enzymes and things that you just need to keep the machinery running properly. So when we don't have that, we end up getting cellular damage. And what all that sort of translates to feeling-wise is uh, you feel tired, you can feel grumpy, you can feel depressed, you can feel irritated, um, brain fog, you know, usually we're not quite sharp after pulling an all-nighter. I don't know about you guys, but I sure am not. Um, and we can actually be in physical pain. Oh, this is... All right, um, this is not, is this the right slide? Sorry, one moment. Okay, somehow the slides got mixed up. I might have been my fault. So, real quickly, I'm gonna give you a um, brief neuroscience lesson. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe that was the right order. Okay, I'm going back. So, I'm gonna give you guys a brief neuroscience 101 lesson just so this all makes sense. Um, there are over 100 neurotransmitters. I'm just gonna talk about these four for now. And um, these are probably, you know, the, the most important ones, of course. And by definition, anything that is a, a molecule that is responsible for some sort of signaling in the nervous system, that's considered a neurotransmitter. So it's a pretty broad term. So um, these ones that I want to talk about. So serotonin, uh, everybody loves serotonin, right? It's yeah. largely responsible for regulating mood and appetite and sleep, and it promotes feelings of peace and wellness and calmness, and um, when we have enough serotonin, we're feeling pretty good. Dopamine, um, another one that people tend to like, it's um, you know implicated in uh, reward centers, states of arousal, motor control, cognition, behavior, and uh, to some extent, mood. Um, 
One thing I forgot to mention about serotonin, which I think is very interesting, is a majority of uh, the serotonin receptors are actually in our gut, about 80%. So um, later on, I'll talk about serotonergic drugs that affect the serotonin syndrome, or sorry, that affect the serotonin system. Um, but I think it's sort of a commonality that when we take a, a drug that has serotonergic activity, it tends to um, purge our colons, as you guys may have noticed. That, at least for me, as soon as I take something that's a serotonin drug, it's like, all right, to the porta potty. Um, then we have glutamate. And um, glutamate is like the most abundant neurotransmitter in the body. It's extremely important. And it plays a really, really vital role in um, learning and memory and neuroplasticity and overall just activation of the nervous system. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's basically responsible for creating the electrical currents that propagate a signal that's sent out from you know, the, the nervous system to somewhere else in the body. Um, GABA, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and its job is basically to decide when to veto glutamate. Like, so, you know, glutamate is responsible for exciting the neuron, and GABA is responsible for inhibiting glutamate, um, glutamate's activation when it's appropriate. And when it, when it comes down to it, GABA and glutamate are really the stars of the show. Serotonin and dopamine and, and all these other neurotransmitters, they really modulate glutamate and GABA. So glutamate and GABA are like the yin and yang of the nervous system. There's this push-pull relationship between the two. It's like the on and off switch of the light. Um, and they end up you know, balancing each other out, ideally, when you're in perfect homeostasis. And if you're in an imbalanced state, you can have overexcitation or glutamate excitotoxicity, or you can have, you know, um, a B2 inhibited and not have an active enough nervous system. But actually, typically in pathology, glutamate uh, excitotoxicity is um, more of the trend that we see happening in the nervous system. So this is our, our neuron, our nerve cell. And um, as you can see, the, the cell body is where the nucleus is. And that's where all the DNA and the information that tells it how to be a neuron is stored. And then we have these branch-like structures called dendrites. So um, what happens is a neighboring cell that also has these branchy-like things, these dendrites, will um, expel neurochemical signals such as serotonin or glutamate or whatever neurotransmitter. And what happens is they bind to these dendrites and um, depending on if it's excitatory or inhibitory, uh, assuming it's glutamate, it binds, activates an electrical current called an action potential, which gets propagated through this um, axon structure. And this axon structure is insulated with something called a myelin sheath. It's like this fatty layer that basically it's similar to the rubber coating on a wire. It's so that electricity doesn't just leak out. It helps the electrical current travel long distances very efficiently. And then the signal gets all the way to the axon terminal, where it then spits out some neurotransmitters to the next cell to propagate the signal. Does that make sense? It's like domino effect. It's, it's like telephone a little bit. Um, so that's sort of the basic, uh, here, there's a, a very nice drawing, it's kind of pixelated, but um, let's go back to that. They don't really look like Skittles, but um, <laughs> this drawing kind of gives you an idea of, of a synapse. So um, at, the, at the end of the dendrites, there's these structures called synaptic spines, and they <laughs> hold everything at once. So they, they get really close to each other, but they don't quite touch. And that space in between is called the synaptic cleft, and that's where one of them you know, spits out its juicy stuff, and then the other one receives it um, and binds those neurotransmitters to their receptors, and then carries on the signal to the next cell. Make sense, right? All right. 
Um, so, when glutamate binds to a receptor and activates a neuron and creates an action potential, um, it causes an influx of calcium to flow into the cell. And, <laughs> hi Isaac. And um, this can open up the mitochondrial pores and release a bunch of free radical compounds. And this is just the natural um, function of a neuron doing its thing. And free radicals are being generated as we live every day. It's part of life. Um, and a lot of it is mostly just from the mitochondria processing the oxygen to turn it into ATP energy. And it's, it's a part of life, it's a part of aging, and um, you know, oxygen brings us, us life and sort of paradoxically death at the same time. So with normal nervous system activity, we have the production of free radicals being released into our cells. And this causes something called oxidative stress. Um, and I'm trying to somewhere I have a cool picture. Maybe it's there. It is. <laughs> so, <laughs> does anyone know what a free radical actually means or is? Yeah. Okay. I got all these scientists in here. All right. Well, for those of you that don't know, <clears throat> atoms like to have pairs of electrons because life's more fun with a buddy, right? <laughs> so. I found this picture and I thought it was so freaking funny. I was like, I gotta put this in here. So here we got this mean guy. He's all pissed off because he obviously has an odd number of electrons. And so he's like, I wanna have an even number in my valence. I'm gonna steal somebody else's. And so he goes and steals this electron from this other poor atom. And then now this guy has an odd number and he's like, well, I need, to, I need an even amount of electrons. So then he steals it from this guy, and then the, this guy steals it from that guy, and this, this just goes on and on until something called an antioxidant neutralizes the free radical. Does that make sense? So um, in particular, the nervous system and the brain are, are super susceptible to oxidative stress, and that's in part because um, a lot of the neural tissue is um, composed of lipid-like bilayers, so there's a lot of fatty substance that makes up our brain, and it's, um, it's more <laughs> the fatty parts of our cells are more susceptible to oxidative stress. And um, so this goes on and can be stealing electrons from um, critical structural parts of our cells which causes damage, right? And um, going back to this, oh crap, hold on, come on, this is all sorts of crazy, okay, there we are, sorry. Um, so when we have oxidative stress damaging um, the structure of our cells, our body sends the army, they send these uh, molecules called cytokines, which are pro-inflammatory um, molecules, and they go, oh, there's damage, we need to go clean things up. Well, unfortunately, the process of inflammation creates uh, free radicals as a byproduct. Kind of dumb, I don't really know who designed that. So you end up causing more oxidative stress, and then you send more cytokines, and it's like this, this vicious cycle. And this is exactly why when we break our ankle or something, we ice it to disrupt the inflammation process. Otherwise, your body's a little overambitious, and it's trying to help, and it's just making things worse. So this can happen to our brain cells also. And as you can see, um, it's kind of not the best picture, but on the left is like a healthy um, sample of brain tissue, and on the right is one that has been damaged from inflammation. So when our neurons are inflamed, um, these structures such as dendrites and stuff start to like shrivel up and decompose and atrophy, and can even uh, cause total cell death or apoptosis. Um, and that's kind of how neurodegeneration uh, happens, is basically there's too much 
inflammation and, and there's more oxidative stress happening than there is ability to neutralize it with antioxidant molecules. All right, oh my goodness. And I'll, I'll get back to um, combating oxidative stress and stuff later. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the drugs. <laughs> so as I mentioned, um, we have the serotonergic drugs, and, and these are very generalized drug categories. Like the reality of it is, most drugs are interacting with a lot of different neurotransmitter systems and, and other systems, and it's pretty complex, but these are the generalized sort of uh, basic systems that are being predominantly affected by these drugs. So um, of course we have MDMA, is a very popular serotonergic drug, and the way that that works is the drug um, binds to serotonin reuptake transporters and um, it actually blocks the reuptake of serotonin similar to SSRIs, that mechanism, um, and basically causes a, a dumping of all your supply, not all your supply, about 80% of your supply of serotonin into the synaptic cleft and um, so your your serotonin just binding to all these receptors all at once and it feels like a party in there, you know? It's like, whoa, all this serotonin, this is great. Um, and then we have the classical psychedelics and um, LSD, mushrooms, DMT, and then, you know, sort of mescaline and ibogaine as well are serotonergic. Uh, and they're, they're serotonin agonists, which basically means that they're shaped similarly enough to serotonin that they fit into the receptor and stimulate it as if it was serotonin. It kind of tricks your body and you know, puts that, the key in the lock and it kind of fits. Um, so the difference between MDMA and these psychedelics that are uh, agonists is that MDMA is using your body's own supply of serotonin, which means you have to make more. Uh, you know, you, you kind of, if you borrow money from a bank, you gotta pay it back. So the cool thing about the psychedelics is um, you're not actually dumping your own supply of serotonin. You're like using this other molecule to like, you know, fit in the key lock and uh, it feels nice because it's tickling that receptor as if it was serotonin, but um, then you don't feel as bad the next day. Um, something that I forgot to include there but I like to talk about is some of these synthetic serotonergic drugs, and a lot of them are um, analogs, a lot of them Sasha Shulgin made. Um, and I would uh, approach those with caution. Um, you know, some of those include 2CB, 2CI, 2CE, um, DOB, DOM, there's, you know, there's all sorts of letters and numbers and stuff. Um, NBOM is an, another LSD analog that's been circulating around, and they're called research chemicals for a reason. There's not a lot of research on them. And um, they do tend to have neurotoxic properties and there have been fatalities reported around them. So I would exercise caution if you choose to experiment with those drugs. All I know is Dave Nichols is skeptical of them and he's one of the world's leading um, psychedelic pharmacology experts. And so if he's a little bit sketched out, I think that's a good, a good um, thing to take into consideration. Tell people about Arrowhead. What's that? About Arrowhead. Arrowhead, yeah, so if you guys don't know about Arrowhead, um, I mean, I do have a, a list of resources that I can tell you guys about, but since I actually brought it up, Arrowhead's a really great site where you can learn all sorts of information about pretty much every molecule under the sun. Like, there's all these trip reports and there's um, scientific papers and all sorts of stuff. So um, if you, you know, want me to write it down or something later, I can do that. All right, um, so then we have the dopaminergic drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, um, which include meth, bath salts, Adderall, you know, prescriptions as well. And then the opioids like heroin, Vicodin, Percocet, morphine, um, and then for some reason I didn't put nicotine up there, but it is uh, indirectly dopaminergic. And as you guys may have noticed, um, I keep, this button is like sensitive, come on. As you guys may have noticed, all, all the dopaminergic drugs tend to be drugs of abuse that are addictive. And um, that's because of the dopaminergic property. You know, dopamine 
really plays a fundamental role in um, uh, positive reinforcement in the reward circuitry of the brain. And it's there for a reason, you know, and, and say we're in our wild caveman state um, and we find like a fruit tree and there's all this sugar in the fruit, uh, it's gonna release a bunch of dopamine because it's saying, hey, we don't get this you know, easily accessible sugar and calories in our wild state. You need to eat as much of this now as you can. And same thing for things like sex. It's like, oh, look, a mate, you need to procreate. You need to have sex with that other female or male or whatever. So there is an important um, you know, underlying reason why we're, why we're rigged this way. But unfortunately, in our modern day, we've um, figured out how to sort of um, cheat a little bit and just like press the feel good button. Um, GABA. So I have alcohol in the GABA section, even though alcohol is really, really quite promiscuous, but I would say it's mostly a GABA, um, a GABA agonist. And um, Xanax and Valium are, you know, some anti anxiety prescription drugs that are GABA agonists as well. And um, I guess I forgot to write GHB, which I want to talk more about later as well. Um, and then we have glutamate. Uh, a majority of the recreational drugs that involve glutamate uh, systems are actually glutamate antagonists, which means they block glutamate activity. So they'll fit into the receptor, but they won't activate it, but they'll kind of like cock block a regular glutamate molecule from binding. Um, and some examples of that are nitrous oxide and ketamine and PCP, which no one seems to do that anymore these days. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know anyone that does PCP. Um, and then I'm going to briefly sort of mention the uh, endocannabinoid system, um, which has you know cannabis and um, the synthetic cannabinoids. As most of you probably know, cannabis is like one of the safest substances on the earth. Uh, there's not much to say about that as far as a harm reduction talk. Um, but the synthetic cannabinoids, or spice, um, actually have a lot of risks, and people actually have died from them. So um, cannabis, um, like THC and CBD molecules, they have partial affinity for the CB1 receptor. Uh, and these synthetic analogs of the, the natural you know, versions have full affinity for the receptors. So they fit into the receptors differently and actually cause a bunch of health problems and are neurotoxic and show potential for addiction and have killed people. So just smoke the real stuff. Don't, don't bother with the spice. All right, there's my cool picture again. Um, okay, now I wanna talk about drug interactions. Um, so as you probably can infer, Alcohol is by far the sluttiest of the sluts. Like, it's all over the place as far as which uh, neurotransmitter systems it's interacting with. And because of that, it makes things really messy and complicated and creates so much potential for drug interactions. It's probably one of the most reactive substances that we know of. Um, and uh, one example is uh, if you mix alcohol and cocaine, Inside your liver, you're, they merge into a supervillain and create cocaethylene. Well, superhero depends on your perspective, I guess. Um, yeah, cocaethylene, it's definitely um, ups the euphoria and the high, but it also increases the risks of like cardiac arrest and um, just toxicity in general. So it makes things significantly more dangerous when those two molecules um, merge together in your liver. And um, alcohol is especially dangerous with opiates, amphetamines, um, other GABA drugs like GHB. It's a really bad idea to drink alcohol if you take GHB. Um, and MDMA as well, and, and ketamine, which I don't have up there. But alcohol really isn't very safe to mix with anything, except maybe psychedelics, just because psychedelics are so damn safe. So, um, Oh, that was one thing I did forget to talk about. Real quick, I want to say um, which one of these drugs are toxic and which ones are not toxic. So um, the classical psychedelics have thus far been found to be non-toxic and non-addictive. Um, MDMA 
is actually a type of amphetamine, um, but characteristically, it's much different um, because most amphetamines are, are significantly dopaminergic. And MDMA is sort of an anomaly because it's primarily serotonergic. However, there is dopamine activity happening consequently from MDMA. And for this reason, um, it is slightly neurotoxic. It's not significantly dangerous. Like I think MDMA is one of the safer recreational drugs to take, um, but it is slightly neurotoxic. And the reason is uh, anything that's having dopamine activity going on, dopamine naturally metabolizes into a free radical. So even though it's a neurotransmitter, it's actually a neurotoxin as well. Um, so if you notice, all the dopamine drugs are the most toxic ones, and that's because of the dopamine activity. Yes? Uh, so did you specifically find MDMA to be psychic? You specifically about partying and whatever it is that you feel So I'll, I'll talk about the adulterants later. Yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll also, I'll leave it till the end of the talk. I'll answer your question. Um, Okay, and then um, nitrous oxide is also non-toxic. Um, the only really effect from using a lot of that is it depletes your B12 storage. So if you're taking that, maybe um, take some B12. And then cannabis is non-toxic, and the synthetic cannabinoids are toxic. So I just wanted to quickly go over that. Um, okay, back to the drug interactions. Um, so in general, any of the dopaminergic drugs, you don't really want to mix with each other or, or anything. Like they're kind of all just dangerous, even on their own to some extent. So you definitely don't want to mix them with each other. So be wary of cocaine, amphetamines, um, uh, opioids, alcohol, any, any of those things, you don't want to mix and match those. Um, another thing is that alcohol and MDMA does this as well. Um, they inhibit enzymes in the body um, that are responsible for metabolizing substances. So there's this pharmacokinetic sort of, you know, normally with a drug, you take it and then you peak and then it comes down, right? It makes like a little symmetrical mountain. Not drug, not, not alcohol and MDMA. They, because they're inhibiting the enzymes that are supposed to degrade the alcohol or MDMA, it actually gets skewed a little bit. And because of this, uh, whatever other toxins are circulating in your system at that moment will begin to accumulate because you've inhibited their ability to decompose. So because of that, mixing MDMA and alcohol with other drugs that um, can be toxic can be dangerous. Um, I also want to talk about pharmaceutical drugs um, and their interactions such as SSRIs and MAOIs. Um, SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, and as I told you earlier with MDMA, they um, operate on a, the same mechanism basically where they block the reabsorption of serotonin back into the cell where it gets recycled and then eventually released later. It stops that from happening, so it traps all your serotonin um, into the synapse so that you feel like you have a lot of serotonin. Um, for me, the problem I see with that is, well, if you're serotonin deficient and that's why you need an SSRI, then stopping your ability to recycle it kind of just creates more of a deficit if you think about it logically. So um, I personally don't think that, that that makes sense for me, but. What happens to serotonin when it's stuck in the neural, uh, the synapse? If it's stuck out, does it just get broken down? So yeah, that's what I'm, I'm gonna talk about as well. So um, there are certain drugs. Um, so if you mix an SSRI with, for example, an MAOI, um, I'll tell you what an MAOI is first. So MAOI stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitor. I have a feeling this group might know a little bit more about those. Uh, so there's an enzyme in the body called monoamine oxidase and it's responsible for degrading neurotransmitters and regulating how much are circulating through the body. Because if you accumulate too many neurotransmitter molecules in the synaptic cleft, 
they become toxic and you can develop something called serotonin syndrome. You can actually have too much serotonin in there and you can suffer from um, you know, tremors or shivering or vomiting or even coma and death. So it's a really serious condition. So you never wanna mix uh, an MAOI with an SSRI um, or an SSRI with other drugs such as opiates or um, GABA drugs. Anything that's a sedative, if you mix it with an SSRI, it can be dangerous. And um, an MAOI basically is a drug that inhibits this enzyme's ability to digest these neurotransmitters. So, you know, you get an accumulation of them, which makes you feel really great. And that's why they're prescribed as uh, antidepressants, because they increase the amount of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And, um, if you are taking some sort of drug that is simultaneously increasing the levels of those neurotransmitters, you could have a neurotoxic effect and have a really dangerous bad drug interaction. Did that sort of answer your question? So this enzyme is, goes through and dissolves whatever's left in the synapse and then your body regulates and makes sure it's like, you know, imbalanced. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so you lose serotonin, so it gets out there and it gets broken down. It's actually getting broken down. Yeah, once it's dumped out there, your body goes, okay, we clean up the mess, and then it goes about its business, yeah. And so you, like, you get a little depressed later because you don't have it naturally. Right, because you've just, yeah, you've spit it out and then your body eats it up and then you gotta make more. All right, um, and I already talked about the non-linear pharmacokinetics of MDMA and alcohol, um, so I'm kind of going a little bit out of order, sorry. And then I want to talk about, um, is it okay if we save it to the end, or do you? Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, okay, cool. So if you have a slide about something. I do, I do. That's what I figured. Yeah, yeah, if you guys wait, I'll, anything I don't cover, then you can ask. Okay, um, so as she was uh, mentioning, I want to talk about adulterants. So a lot of uh, MDMA or ecstasy or whatever else people think they're buying have adulterants in them and that's just the nature of the black market. And a lot of them have methylone in them which is an amphetamine and MDMA analog. It's actually bath salts, like the original, it's one of the original bath salt molecules that they put out onto the market um, and then they made them illegal and then now they've made new analogs um, for people to get high off, and it's just they're always chasing, you know, these new designer drugs that people are creating. And um, a lot of them also have methamphetamines in it because it's cheap to put those in as a substitute. Piperzines, um, research chemicals, and uh, various other fillers in drugs. And um, even things like LSD, oops, even things like LSD can be research chemical. You know, they figured out how to um, put things like in bomb. <laughs> Are you laughing at my lack of control of this no. thing? <laughs> okay. Um, oh my goodness. I'm not even touching this thing. It's got a mind of its own. All right. My finger's not even on the button. There's a ghost in here. Okay, so now that I've scared you all, um, what can we do to be safe? Well, um, Dance Safe sells these reagent test kits for like 60 bucks, and you can test your substance um, with these various chemical reagents and figure out exactly what it is. And then from there, you can decide if it's something that you want to take or something that um, is too dangerous. Um, another great resource is pillreports.com and ecstasydata.org. And these are both like large databases where people will you know, post a picture of a certain press pill or whatever, you know, oh, this one's a green Buddha or whatever, and um, sometimes they'll do the reagent tests and they'll take pictures so you can see it, and they'll also write a trip report and be like, oh, well, this was a little speedy, or this was, seemed like a nice clean roll and I went to bed right afterwards, and then you can look up your color and press a pill and decide if that seems like a pill that you uh, feel comfortable taking. So that's pretty cool. Another rule that I have is uh, if it's bitter, it's a spitter. And this is pertaining mostly to LSD. LSD is a, um, it has no taste and no smell. And so if you take something that's supposed to be LSD and it has a strong bitter flavor, it's likely a research chemical that might not be as safe as, and non-toxic as LSD. So if it's bitter, it's a spitter. And then of course, um, 
try to avoid mixing drugs, especially the toxic ones. I know it's fun and it makes things more interesting, but if you do decide to mix drugs, um, please be mindful of which drugs you're mixing and how much of them you're mixing. Um, and, and try to pay attention to, you know, are, am I mixing the toxic drugs? Am I mixing the dopaminergic drugs? Because those are the ones with the higher risks, okay? Do you need your question answered now? Yeah, okay. No, it's actually um, a relatively safe combination. And actually on my website, I have a very extensive drug interaction chart. And it's, it has like all these different drugs listed and then it has them listed again. So you can see where they match up with each other and it'll tell you if they're synergistic and safe or synergistic and unsafe or if there's no synergistic effect. Uh, it has all these different um, ways of classifying. So, Afterwards, if you are interested, I'll make sure you guys can get to the website and look at that chart. It's really cool and colorful. <laughs> okay, um, so nutritional defense. So now that we've all um, agreed and, and realized that this probably does some damage when we stay up all night and take all these things, what can we do about it? Well. Um, so a lot of times we are depleting our supply of neurotransmitter. And regardless of if we even decide to take drugs, just not sleeping uh, really has devastating effects on the nervous system. A lot of important processes are happening while we sleep. We make new neurotransmitters, we make antioxidants, we basically clear all, all the metabolic waste and um, rebuild our cells and get things regenerated. And so if we're not sleeping, um, we don't have time to do that and we're kind of running out of resources the longer we stay up, which is why we get progressively weaker and weaker. So, um, as far as restoring neurotransmitters, um, tryptophan is an amino acid and in the body tryptophan is converted to 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. You guys heard of that? Yeah, everybody's taking it, right? So. Um, yeah, tryptophan gets converted to 5-HTP, which then can cross the blood-brain barrier and become serotonin. And later on, it might even become melatonin down the, down the road. Um, one of the reasons that people tend to take 5-HTP instead of tryptophan is it's already a step closer to becoming serotonin, and it also can go through the blood-brain barrier, whereas tryptophan cannot. Tryptophan has to be converted first. So it, it's converted into serotonin much faster and more effectively than tryptophan. And tryptophan can also be allocated towards a lot of other molecules in the body. So that's why 5-HTP uh, is the preferred um, method to getting a lot of serotonin quicker. And then we have tyrosine, which is another amino acid. And tyrosine gets converted into uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. And um, the B vitamins, you know, B6, B12, B3, B9, niacin, thiamine, um, riboflavin, uh, methylcobalamin, all those guys, they all play a really crucial role in the conversion of these amino acids to their respective neurotransmitter. So if you're deficient in B vitamins, your body is not able to take those amino acids and turn them into neurotransmitter. And this is also important um, in the implications around mood disorders and depression. Because if you're, if you're nutritionally deficient, you don't have the cofactors to enzymatically create these neurotransmitters. Magnesium and zinc are also important uh, minerals for that, that neurotransmitter synthesis process. Okay? So, um, taking supplements of those or eating foods rich in those nutrients is a really great idea after, um, I mean, even if you're, you don't have to even necessarily be partying, like those are just good for general health, right? But especially when you're feeling depleted, get these things inside of you quickly because then you can start making more serotonin and dopamine um, faster. Uh, unfortunately, tryptophan and tyrosine are not super abundant in plant protein. So if you're vegetarian or vegan, it can be hard to get a sufficient amount of these 
amino acids, but there are supplements that you can take that are isolated amino acids. So you don't, you don't have to eat animal tissue if, um, if you don't want to. Um, nutrients for cell repair, again, you know, B vitamins, like, they're important for a lot of different things. Same with the minerals, like, they're being used by the body in so many different ways that I can't even, I don't have enough time to sit here and describe to you all the, the purposes that those vitamins and minerals have, but they're important, just trust me. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are really crucial because as I mentioned earlier, much of the brain is comprised of fatty acids and they're getting oxidized on a regular basis, so you need to keep making more all the time, so you better be eating your omega-3 fatty acids so that your body can rebuild these cell membranes. Um, as far as combating oxidative stress and inflammation, which um, as I told you are really sort of results of each other, um, so yes, antioxidants, right? That's what neutralizes free radicals. So there's been, you know, antioxidants has been a big buzzword lately. Um, and it is true, eating antioxidant rich food is, is obviously really good for you. You know, all these fruits and vegetables with dark leafy greens and berries and superfoods and blah, 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 they are good for you, don't get me wrong. But they don't, those, those compounds in those foods aren't actually directly neutralizing the oxidative stress. What they actually do is cause a little bit of oxidative damage and they stimulate your body's endogenous um, systems of making antioxidants like glutathione or superoxide dismutase. dismutase. Um, so they almost like irritate um, epigenetically and cause you to upregulate these pathways to make your own supply of antioxidant because the reality of it is you could never consume enough to effectively neutralize all the oxidative uh, free radicals that are in your body. So it's really like a hermetic effect that these antioxidant compounds in plants um, and foods are helping us fight oxidative damage and aging. Um, some of my uh, favorite, favorite antioxidant um, herbs or plants or whatever are um, blueberry, turmeric, ashwagandha, uh, milk thistle, ginseng. Um, I mean, every, everything in all the plant world is full of antioxidants. Like, I can't think of a single freaking vegetable that doesn't have something valuable in it. So, yay plants. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about regenerating neurons. There's this really cool growth factor called BDNF. It stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And um, basically, it's a, a growth factor. It's a, it's a protein that stimulates the um, sprouting of new dendrites, synaptic spines, and even new whole neurons. So up until about the late 90s, early 2000s, which is like not that long ago, um, neuroscientists believed that you were born with all your brain cells and then whatever you killed in binge drinking or concussions was like too bad. You know, it was gone forever and you weren't gonna grow up any new brain cells back and that was just it. That's actually not true. There are a couple areas in the brain that there is neurogenesis um, happening and there is uh, neural, neural stem cells creating new young neurons. And this is mostly in the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb, which is um, for smell sensation. Um, so that's a really cool recent sort of um, acceptance by the scientific community. And they're finding that BDNF really plays a crucial role in a lot of um, mood disorders and neurodegenerative diseases and, and pathology of the nervous system. They're finding that when people, people's brains are sick, a lot of times it has to do with them not upregulating this growth factor enough. So it's a hot topic right now in neuroscience. And um, there's a lot of really awesome free and affordable things that upregulate this growth factor, um, including exercise, meditation, listening to music, um, fasting, and then there's a number of foods, so turmeric and blueberry upregulate this growth uh, hormone in the hippocampus, and also um, L-theanine is an amino acid. Um, 
And the psychedelic drugs also upregulate this growth factor, which I think may be one of the reasons that they are so um, effectively able to rewire these traumatic brain networks. And I think that's one of the implications of why they're so effective for treating depression and addiction and PTSD and then depression and anxiety because they're, they're sprouting you a garden of new brain cells to rewire your brain in a healthier, happier way, which is amazing. Um, and actually, SSRI drugs also upregulate BDNF. And I think there's been a lot of speculation lately um, that perhaps SSRI drugs, when they are somewhat effective in patients, it might not have anything to do with the abundance of serotonin activity. It might be because they're upregulating this growth factor, um, and, and maybe that's why they work sometimes. And if that's the case, well, there's a lot of much more effective ways to upregulate that with way less side effects. So, you know, these seem like better options to me than taking SSRIs, if BDNF it really is the underlying mechanism for why they're effective sometimes. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I went over the details of sort of the different specific molecules and why they're important. Um, but if an overarching sort of guide, you know, try to eat a lot of protein-rich foods that have tyrosine and tryptophan to make new neurotransmitters. And um, raw fruits and veggies, because they have all sorts of amazing minerals and vitamins and antioxidants. And um, coconut water is good because there's all sorts of electrolytes in there. Um, and then if you aren't able to get concentrations of these materials enough, you can take them in supplement form. And like I said, there's no substitute for sleep. It's a really important metabolic um, process for your body to repair all of the damage that just happened throughout the day of being in a waking state. And um, also I mentioned avoiding wheat and dairy because these are inflammatory promoting foods and they actually uh, inhibit your body's ability to make antioxidant molecules. And this is not, you don't have to be celiac or gluten sensitive for this to occur. This is in the basic human biology. This is happening in everyone. So um, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me. Hopefully it wasn't boring. Um, <laughs> thank you. If you're interested, um, my website is entheozen.com, and um, I do sell my party recovery supplements on there that have a lot of the things that I mentioned. Um, and I do fully intend to donate to MAPS when I'm profitable. That might not be for a while, but I am committed to making that happen someday. Um, and there's a lot of other cool stuff on the website besides stuff to buy. Um, I post a lot of video blogs and articles and just information about neuroscience. And if you're interested in uh, signing up for my newsletter about once or twice a month, I send out a newsletter and I try to uh, make sure there's interesting, there you go, he's, he's holding it up back there for you guys. I try to make sure it's interesting and not just um, super like salesy or anything. I, I, I put suggested articles and events and, and really cool books that I've read that I, are related to neuroscience or entheogens or mood disorders or um, anything of that sort of flavor. So um, yeah, feel free to go back there and get one of my cards. Um, I also have these little uh, postcard things that have a QR code to uh, the neuroscience of partying a link on my website and you can scan it with your smartphone or you can just go to my website and click on it and it has um, a video of not this talk but uh, the same talk that I did at another time and I also have the text version of all this information and I have that cool chart with the cool colorful drug interaction things on it so um, if you guys want to check that out I have those postcards back there and I also have a couple of the Weekend Warrior Party Recovery Packs for sale back there as well. So feel free to come up and chat with me. I love connecting and, and chatting about whatever you want to chat about. So thank you so much for listening.
Okay. Um, so if there's any questions now, all right, yes. Hi. Right. I mean, as I discussed, um, there's a lot of ways, you know, to combat the oxidative stress. There's an abundance of antioxidant molecules found in nature. With MDMA and alcohol, mixing those two, it's not so much the concern about oxidative stress. It's the um, concern about overdosing your system with toxic substance because they both inhibit those enzymes that are so fundamental for metabolizing those drugs. If you can't metabolize them, they're stuck in there and they just keep circulating around and keep poisoning you until, I mean, a lot of people I know will do MDMA and they'll also drink and they usually are fine, but um, it just takes that one sensitive person or that one person who's you know drinking 10 tequila shots and then taking MDMA and their body just can't take all the toxicity and it can't metabolize the toxins because of those inhibited enzymes. So just proceed with caution, yeah. Anyone else, yeah? It's kind of a two part question, but how do you come up with your formula for your product and is there a certain um, drug that it helps uh, heal or restore brain function and better than brain function? So he asked um, how I came up with the formula and, and does it cater to like a certain type of um, drug or whatever. Um, the cool thing about it is it's kind of like, a, it kind of covers all your bases. You know, I, I mindfully um, made it so that it would restore serotonin and um, norepinephrine and um, dopamine. And because oxidative stress is kind of the general mechanism for any damage in the body really, it, um, it sort of covers your bases. I mean, you don't even have to be partying to really benefit from it. I take my supplement when I feel like it, when I just feel like I want some vitamins, minerals, and plant extracts. Um, so you don't have to even be partying. Like, like I said, the, the principles of um, optimal brain health and resilience are, are pretty consistent no matter what you're doing. You know, if you're partying or if you just don't want to feel depressed for no reason, a healthy brain is always the answer. Um, and as far as your other question, how did I formulate it? I spent a lot of time reading NIH papers and going to neuroscience conferences and taking online courses and reading neuroscience books. Like I really just immersed myself in the neuroscience um, world and I'm continuing to do that. And so my, my formula keeps changing and being updated. So the one that I have for sale now is actually the um, the initial, the uh, beta, beta testing formula. So once I get through that, I will have new and improved formulas in the future for you guys. Just keeps getting better. <laughs> yes? Um, maybe that was <laughs> easier. Um, so I've been curious about MAOI, um, for MAO inhibitors. And because um, I know that the ayahuasca vine, that's what that that's what allows you to orally ingest the right. shakuna to be able to have the DMT effect. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard that if you take um, an MAO inhibitor tea, like Siri and Rue, mm -hmm. before you smoke and in DMT, um, you have a prolonged effect. Mm -hmm. And that really confused me because I thought it was because it was causing the changes in your stomach so that it was absorbed. I didn't, and so I'm a little confused at how it would still be affecting you outside of your stomach right. situation. Right, right. <laughs> um, so it, monoamine oxidase is not only in your stomach. It's in your entire body. And um, you know, if you think about it, its role in regulating neurotransmitters that are floating around, of course that would be happening in your brain. And it's kind of floating around in the cytosolic fluid, um, you know, in, in the synaptic cleft, grabbing neurotransmitters and like munching them up. 
Um, so it's not only happening in the stomach. That's just where a lot of it is happening um, because any, any sort of amino acid or whatever that you're eating, it's why you can't take serotonin straight because it, it'll just um, degrade it. But when you smoke it, it's still degrading. That's why it doesn't last forever, right? Because it it's get, gets munched up by this enzyme. And so that's why it prolongs it is because it's still inhibiting the enzyme that is um, metabolizing DMT. It's just uh, not quite as dramatic because you're smoking it versus eating. Does that make sense to answer your question? So it's, it's MAO is, is everywhere, <laughs> not just in your stomach. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Um, one of the drugs that you didn't mention that people commonly use a lot, and therefore I must imagine just even whether they're thinking about it or not, So I was wondering if you had an opinion on whether or not that was, I was what your general thoughts were about caffeine and the use with other drugs. And, right. Um, the second question I had is you talked a lot about things that you can take to recover, but I'm wondering if there's any things that are recommended to take going into a drug experience that could, could either protect against something or make right. it enhance it. Because I've had people tell me that taking 5-HTP before doing MDMA can kind of build up your store that gets used, you know, something like that. Right, right. Um, I think all of these things can act as, what's that? Oh, okay, so he asked um, first about um, caffeine. I didn't really mention caffeine. Um, and then he asked also about what you can do um, preventively before you take a substance or whatever. And actually, all these things I mentioned Knock yourself out and take them before you do your drugs, too. Uh, the only reason I don't advise people that is for really just liability reasons, because in case there's some crazy, unique drug interaction that happens, like a freak incident, that's why I don't tell people to take things before they take drugs. Um, but like, if your system is healthy and has all these resources and has all these antioxidant supplies and all these abundance of uh, neurotransmitters and B vitamins and minerals, it's gonna be better off to um, combat any sort of stress on the body anyway. So yeah, be my guest, like take this stuff before you party. Um, and as far as caffeine goes, I'm not like a super expert on caffeine, probably because it's just not interesting enough to learn that much about. Um, but yeah, it's a stimulant obviously. And so you should probably be careful if you're like doing cocaine or meth and taking caffeine. Um, and caffeine does sec cause secretion of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, just maybe not to the um, extent that these other drugs do. Um, what I know about caffeine is it's an adenosine antagonist, and adenosine accumulates in the body throughout the day to tell you that you're tired, and caffeine um, basically binds to the adenosine receptors and blocks adenosine from signaling to your body that you're tired, and that's why it makes you feel alert. So yeah, don't do cocaine and a bunch of caffeine. That's all I have to say about that, I guess. Common sense. Yes? I've always sort of wondered, um, you, you mentioned that there were four main neurotransmitters, mm -hmm. serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and glutamate. Mm -hmm. um, and two of those, I know, uh, you know, I've seen them on the shelf at GNC, right? The GABA and the glutamate. The other two, I don't think, Right. My question is, why why are those other two sort of hard to hard to find or um, you know not available? So and, and do oh. we, is it um, does it would it make sense to uh, sort of target those four things level levels of those four things in your body to sort of have the same effect as maybe taking a, a drug like a, a party drug? Um. So yeah, to answer the first part of your question. Um, if you were to, to ingest serotonin or dopamine, MAO would break it down. That's what MAO's job is. It, it, those are monoamines, and monoamine oxidase, is, that's, its job is to um, destroy monoamines that you ingest. And so the reason you have to take the precursors and let your body make the neurotransmitter is because your um, your, your enzymes will degrade it, right? 
Um, as far as the glutamate and GABA, so um, same thing with glutamate, you have to take uh, glutamic acid or glutamine, which is more or less the same as glutamate. It's, it's easy to convert. Um, and then GABA, you know, you can take it because those two aren't monoamines, so you don't, they don't get destroyed by those enzymes right away. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Uh, my question was just sort of uh, if it's you know, oh, if you if can it's restore possible to be more efficient in your sort of manipulation of your own brain if you just sort of deal with those four instead of... Yes, I mean, there's, it's more complicated than those four, I just simplified it. But um, yeah, when, you, when your body is really functioning optimally and it has all the resources it needs to make a lot of neurotransmitter, you feel pretty freaking great. And that's pretty much what I figured out how to do is like give my body all the things it needs to make everything it wants to have. And for that reason, like I don't have depression anymore. Um, but um, yeah, does that, does that make sense? Like the thing is your body has all these tightly regulated controls and biofeedback systems. So it's not going to naturally dump out 80% of its supply of serotonin um, unless you take a drug that does that. Does that make sense? Like the body is so good at maintaining homeostasis and a lot of these times these drugs disrupt homeostasis, which is why we're exhausted afterwards. Um, so you're, yeah, your body is not gonna bring you to these euphoric states typically that the drugs do, unless you do some manipulations, maybe like holotropic breath work or meditation, because you, you can create ecstasy um, by you know using your mind and your body, but um, it, it takes uh, in, in the intention to do it. Yes? Speak about what regarding that? I mean, I'm curious about the process. Um, I've been told that you take it and you trip for three days. I'm, I'm close to somebody who went through this a few times with their terrible addiction. Mm -hmm. And it was the only thing that worked at the end. And um, he said that he woke up detox. I don't know how true that is. Um, and you just go on like, I'm just curious about the process. If you know about it, if not. I don't know about the process, and actually, it's interesting that you bring that up because lately I've felt more compelled to explore that medicine a little bit. Yeah. I actually might know. Uh, we've got a couple people here um, that know a lot about IV games, so yeah. um, you can come up to me afterwards and I can kind of point you in their direction. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an IV game expert, but I'm intrigued myself, so maybe we can both ask them. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Sorry, that's it for the microphone questions, but if you really want to ask me a question, I'm, I'll be here, so feel free to come up. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Here's your clicker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, this has been um, really informative and totally gets my uh, science nerd. <laughs> Very excited. So um, yeah, feel free to um, talk to her and I'll get notes from her so you'll get a follow-up email with um, a lot of the kind of resources um, and other kinds of uh, information from Caitlin.